who are killed there in excruciating conditions. I know that Darwinism does not automatically equate to Nazism. But if Darwinism inspired and justified such horrific events in the past, could it be used to rationalize similar initiatives today? There's a good German expression, so fängt es immer ein. I mean, it always begins in the same way. Um, something to remember in the context of United States discussions of euthanasia and abortion. It always begins in the same way. There seems to be a, an excellent argument for getting rid of useless people by killing them. Or at least it seems excellent to the people advancing the argument. It's the love affair with death and you know, the euthanasia and this movement going on, which I find appalling. And the idea is that you know, immediately rid our society of anybody who might be a drain um, and think of people in economic terms. And I think that's where some of the Darwin fits in, actually. It's a, just a devaluing of human life. First of all, if you take seriously that evolution has to do with you know, the transition of life forms and that life and death are just natural processes, then one gets to be liberal about abortion and euthanasia. All of those kinds of ideas uh, seem to me follow very naturally from a Darwinian perspective, a deprivileging of human beings, basically. Uh, and I think that people who want to endorse uh, Darwinism have to sort of take this kind of viewpoint very seriously. And, w and when w we see an elite, and it is an elite, an elite that controls essentially all the research money in science, saying there is no such thing as moral truth, science will not be related to religion. I mean, it's essentially official policy of the National Academy of Science that religion and science will not be related. I mean, hey, you know, that cuts off a lot of debate, doesn't it? What's going to happen if this doesn't change? Well, I think we're watching it happen, aren't we? I needed time to think, so I traveled to the birthplace of this idea. With savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated. We civilized men, on the other hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed and the sick. Thus the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. Charles Darwin, The Descent of Man, 1871.
Throughout the Cold War in Germany, there was this wall erected to keep ideas out. It was erected by people who held an ideology that were afraid of a competition from other ideas that would come into their society. And what we're seeing happening in science today is very much like that. But I think that's just a strategy for protecting a failing ideology from competition. America didn't become the great nation that it is by suppressing ideas. It progressed by allowing freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry. Thomas Jefferson got it right when he wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have given their lives to protect these values, but now they're under threat once again. It wasn't just scientists who were being expelled. It was freedom itself, the very foundation of the American dream, the very foundation of America. If we allowed freedom to be expelled in science, where would it end? The Darwinian establishment is so massive and so entrenched, it appears impenetrable. I couldn't bring it down myself, but I could at least confront those who had expelled the scientists I'd met. What would you say if you had Eugenie Scott sitting next to you? What would you say to her? I would ask her, by what authority does she and, and those like her presume to declare what is and is not science? You know, he's sort of made himself martyr of the day. They've gotten a lot of mileage out of, you know, poor Rick Sternberg. <laughs> And we got lip service from the leadership of the Smithsonian, uh, but I didn't feel they ever followed through. We went into the Smithsonian looking for answers, but we ran into the same stone wall as Congressman Souter. We're not authorized to do this, so stop. He said, nonetheless, you have to be disciplined, and I lost my job. We did get an interview with a spokesman from George Mason. But it was impossible to knock him off his script. Her contract was not renewed. It was simply um, not renewing her contract, which she satisfied. It, her contract was not renewed. It had nothing to do with the controversy of, of, of that topic of intelligent design. I have never been uh, treated like this in my about 30 years in academia. We received a similar reception at Baylor University. They refused to admit that what had happened to Dr. Marx had anything to do with ID. Uh, certainly the conversations I've had, uh, this has not, the uh, intelligent design situation has not been the thrust of the conversation. It's a procedural issue, and uh, that's, that's the way we dealt with it. Funny, that's not how Dean Kelly put things in his original email to Dr. Marx. I'm not mixing my religion with my science. The questions that I ask in, in, in my intelligent design research uh, are perfectly legitimate scientific questions. At least the top guns at Iowa State were willing to own up to their actions. What we wanted to stop is uh, the use of the name of ISU to validate intelligent design elsewhere, and we did succeed. I really think a lot of Guillermo. He's a great guy. So, I mean, that's why I'm kind of disappointed, all right, that he should have just left this alone. So, in my opinion, should have just left it alone. Dr. Hauptmann elaborated further on his great regard for Gonzales. Uh, this is quoting an email from you to Mr. Avalos. You say, sometimes it is just best to ignore idiots, in reference to Guillermo. And then the religious nutcases should be challenged at every opportunity. Yeah, because for example, you, <laughs> um, in that case, I'm thinking more of, say, the creationist crowd who claims that uh, God put all the animals on an ark and that's it. All right? That's where all, all of our animals came from today. That's crazy. Okay? You shouldn't be insulting even children with that kind of thing. So these are the idiots, all right? They've always been around. They've always been around. Going after the perpetrators in each of these cases wasn't getting me anywhere. So I reconnected with Dr. Berlinski and Dr. Schroeder to see if they had any advice. There's a boundary to what science will accept right now. 
I think the parallel is exactly this wall coming down. Ask any Berliner on the east, from the east side what it meant to have the wall come down. If it is possible to make a, a break in the wall that will allow academia to ask these fundamental questions that exist and allow them in the science classrooms as well. It'd be nice to see the scientific establishment lose some of its prestige and power. It'd be nice to see other questions being opened up. Above all, it'd be nice to have a real spirit of self-criticism penetrating the sciences. What can I do to bring down a wall? Is there anything I can do? Make it apparent to the world that a wall exists. There are vast numbers of persons